Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, very welcome to uh, a very important session, though I understand that the uh, not all participants in the World Economic Forum's meeting here in Dalian agree with that, uh, because the, 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 uh, the participation rate is somewhat lower than the demographics of Dalian would suggest. Um, am I doing something? Okay, thank you. Um, as I said, very welcome. My name is Victor Haberstadt. I'm the moderator of this session. The session participants sit to uh, 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 right in front of you. I'm not going to uh, make introductory statements about them because each of them is uh, um, easily identified, well known, and uh, we should use our time as efficient as possible by talking about the subject it's, uh, itself. Uh, the gentleman, uh, actually they're all gentlemen, it's quite interesting. I mean. <laughs> It, it, this, is, this panel is in no way representative of the fact that half the world is women. Uh, uh, but still, we will talk about demographics. Um, it, it, is, it is quite clear that demographics is so high on our agenda because there are a number of, uh, of really major trends which, uh, uh, which require us to talk about it. Just to mention four major trends very quickly for you. Uh, in industrialized countries, uh, the West, Japan, fertilities, fertility rates have gone down, but are possibly going up again. A second major trend is that in the baby boomers in Western countries are reaching retirement age. Thirdly, fertility rates are likely to go up in emerging economies too, with most working population being concentrated, especially in the emerging markets. And the final major trend, I believe, that immigration flows uh, are continuing, increasing, and thus lead also demographically to multicultural societies. And there are consequences of these trends, which we will be discussing in this, uh, in this meeting. One of the consequences, for instance, that 40% of the world population live in what we would call brick countries, countries which are rapidly growing. That's more than double the amount of people living there uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, now, the questions which we can address here are, of course, not unlimited, but we can try to cover as much ground as possible. We we'll do that in an initial round, as we have agreed, by each addressing one question and then subsequently drawing you in. So please, if you have questions, uh, uh, prepare yourself to uh, ask those because we will have real time to have a, uh, uh, an interaction with the audience. Um, one of the major questions which I believe we need to address, and I'm, uh, I'm addressing this then first to, uh, to Göran Hultin, uh, is who is going to benefit from these demographic shifts? Which industries are going to benefit most from what we are now confronting? I mentioned some of the trends. There are other trends. We could put on slides, but I don't think that's necessary. Uh, what, what is the, who, who is going to benefit from this? Which specific industries? Well, I think uh, that it would be probably in this session very hard to uh, give uh, definitive answers in terms of specific industries and sectors. But let me uh, uh, try and, and frame the question, uh, uh, which uh, uh, the way that I would probably construct, start constructing the answers to that. And, and uh, the first po uh, part where I would start would basically asking the question, who and what kind of activities, uh, business activities, stand to, to uh, benefit from a growing and aging population. And obviously, uh, health care is, uh, is one that is always mentioned in this case, but, but it's come dawned on me lately that one needs to actually be much more creative and much more broad in terms of how you, how you put your, your arms around that and, uh, and expanding that to, for instance, qu asking the questions about how urban services can be, will be modified and will grow with the changing needs of a, an aging population. 
There is uh, also the uh, uh, the housing housing uh, uh, area, which uh, uh, recently dawned on me, also in a discussion with one of the world's leading uh, uh, elevator uh, factories uh, uh, manufacturers. They're looking at the uh, uh, aging population as a huge opportunity, yeah. because the housing or living uh, preferences and modalities of an aging population will change, and they will be uh, probably increasingly be living in apartment blocks uh, with a huge uh, growing need for elevators. But that's one part of the other question. If, if I may, just uh, uh, shift the uh, the focus and, and and that and going into into uh, maybe modifying the question, saying which countries will benefit of this? Because it's uh, sort of the benefit is not necessarily only sector sector specific. And here I would uh, uh, just point to uh, to the uh, demographic uh, advantage. Those countries that have the uh, demographic, uh, demographic advantage or those who can obtain the demographic advantage. And obtention of the demographic advantage obviously starts to uh, touch on the whole labor migration uh, issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, uh, the, the point on skills. With the demographic uh, developments, uh, skills, skill shortages are already today very, very uh, difficult. And uh, with the demographic uh, outlook that we're looking at, it's only going to get worse. So uh, those countries that have the, the, the appropriate skill delivery systems in place uh, to accommodate this kind of a demographic shift will also be a beneficia beneficiary of this de development. Thank you. Um, it, it raises one or two questions. We'll, we'll get back to that uh, later, maybe also from other members of the panel. Let me quickly uh, turn to, uh, uh, to Mr. Tiam. And, uh, because included in, in Joram's uh, remarks was a reference to, to gender, so to say. Uh, and as I said to you yesterday in a, in a conversation we had, um, what is the potential of girls' education? I, I, I phrase it as a general question to you. Uh, ha a large part of the, of the world um, um, has girls who have little education, and if they were to more ha have more education, would be incredibly impacting on, uh, on the economy, on GDP growth, and on the potential development of these societies. So is that so, is that, or is that wrong? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, subsequent question, is that good for the insurance companies? <laughs> I, I'll try to do the first part of, of the question first. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Girls' education is a, is a major issue, particularly in, uh, in developing countries. Uh, the statistics actually tend to be mind-boggling. Um, uh, in the 90s, I was in, in Africa in government in, in the Ivory Coast, and I did quite a bit of work on, on this issue. And one thing we'd done was a demography study which showed that uh, educated women in towns had 2.1 children, and illiterate women in the countryside had 8.2. And that is a, a straight line with a correlation, an R-square, which is extremely high. Uh, and it actually debunked a myth, which is that that's cultural. It is not cultural. This is something you observe universally, from Tunisia to the Ivory Coast to Brazil. If you educate women, um, fertility will, will, will fall. But not only does it fall, but those 2.1 children will be healthier. Uh, on average, they'll, they'll be better fed. Their chances of survival will be better, their longevity will be higher, and out of the 8.2 that you get in the countryside, uh, actually a proportion will die, and the surviving ones will probably have some optimal weight and all kinds of associated problems. So uh, it's, it is the, most, the single most powerful lever, actually, to, to transform society and to, to, to reach a, a higher level of, of development. So uh, there is a lot of effort um, going into that. And, uh, all the countries who have gone through that demographic transition have seen that accompanied with a very strong rise uh, in GDP growth, in labor productivity, uh, improvement in health indicators, and uh, general progress in society. So uh, it is certainly um, um, an area worth focusing on and uh, good for development. Now to come to the second part of the question, uh, insurance companies. Um, we are a life insurance company. If you think about our business, it is driven first by GDP growth, 
then by savings rates, and then by, by penetration. So it's actually directly correlated to, to demography. And in all countries where there is a relatively young and growing uh, population, we, we do extremely well because there's a phase of accumulation of wealth and the products we, we, we provide um, give people a vehicle or a, a way to achieve that. Uh, the second aspect by which we, 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 we can be useful is that in developing countries, we, we are really the connection between savings and investment. Uh, we have liabilities in, lo in long-term currency, generally long-term liabilities in local currency, sorry. So we have an appetite for assets in local currency, and we're a very natural investor uh, in the economy, a long-term investor in the economy of long-term capital, and that generally leads to, um, to good GDP growth. So if you look at Prudential in Asia, we're doing very well, and frankly, it's also largely linked to democracy, to demography, sorry. Thank you. Um it's interesting, if I think of girls' education, one region where, I'm just wondering, Gerald, where there is perhaps less attention to it is the region where most of your activities are. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, I think it's a bit of a fallacy that uh, women are not being educated. I, I work out of Dubai and uh, have been working in the Middle East region for the last uh, 30 odd years. And um, I think particularly in a country like the United Arab Emirates, they've made uh, great strides and great achievements in uh, female education. Um, I like to think that when you read all these stories and everything and the reports, that really the best form of contraception, I think, worldwide must be female education, because we hear that uh, as ladies become educated, they get married later, they have uh, fewer children, and as you just said, they become more prosperous and add more to the GDP. But in a place like Dubai, and I'm working in the, in the hotel industry, we have, uh, and this is not a commercial for the company, but we, we have eight hotels in Dubai, and four of the general managers are female, uh, which I think is a, is a great testament to uh, the United Arab Emirates and what has it achieved. When we do career fairs, we find that 66% of the applicants will be female. So females are being educated in, uh, in the Middle East and they're playing a, more, a much more important role than they have in the past. Uh, I just attended a conference recently where uh, our Minister for Social Affairs, uh, Reem Al Hashimi, is a minister. And um, indeed the, the, the whole um, suffrage has been increased within the United Arab Emirates for the election of the Federal National Council on the 24th of September. And uh, females have equal rights to males. I think in Saudi Arabia it is slowly coming around, but women are in business, particularly in our country. Women, thank goodness, uh, are allowed to drive. They're probably the more sensible drivers around. But um, the, the, it is widely understood by the government that uh, female education is vital uh, for the development of the country. And um, I also think it's quite an interesting thing that you know, we talk very much about, on one side we have uh, the developed world where we say we, we will not have enough people, and then you have the developing world where we say we have too many people. And I think that the, the situation is, is uh, pretty obvious that we really have to start working towards the uh, mobility of labour, which I know the World Economic Forum has been paying a lot of attention to, and it's something that has to uh, develop in the future. In our country where we work, uh, especially, say, in our industry, 98% of the workforce is foreign. And uh, that is interesting in an area where the overall Middle East, we're told we have to cre create upwards of 100 million jobs in the next 15 to 20 years in order to absorb the, uh, the growing population, of which at the moment the vast majority, particularly in the GCC, is, uh, is under 25 years of age. So there is a lot to do, but there's a much more enlightened approach than I think the region is given credit for, and the type of press that we get, and uh, the, the proof of it is very much in what's happening within the GCC, particularly in the United Arab Emirates. Thank you. Um, it, it still, one wonders, of course, because in the region where, where uh, your activities are, is at the same time a region with a very large high unemployment rate, right? Yes. Um, and so how is that demographic threat to be dealt with then? Well, I think the, the whole threat has to be dealt with by concentrating on education. And uh, within that region, there isn't enough concentration, I believe, on vocational education. Mm -hmm. Children go to school, children come out of school, and uh, if they're qualified, or sometimes if they're not even qualified, they go on to university. 
and then the levels of university are not really achieving the, the, the quality that they need to achieve. And within our industry, we are very prepared and we, we actually want to employ more and more regional people to work within our industry. Our tourists, our guests expect when they go to Arabia to be, uh, to, to be interacting with Arabian staff, which is uh, quite, quite a normal want for our guests. But I do think that it comes back very much to education. And again, within the GCC where the resources exist, education is uh, paramount and is getting the deserved attention. But it's certainly in other parts of the region, such as, uh, let's say, Palestine, uh, Egypt, and the poorer areas, they need a lot more uh, emphasis on education. Our Prime Minister the, and the ruler of Dubai, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, uh, at a World Economic Forum in Jordan four years ago, pledged a billion dollars, upwards of a billion dollars, to education in the Arab world. So I think that the richer countries of the Middle East do understand that if they don't uh, help the rest of the region to be educated, then long term we will suffer because we will we'll have the wrong demographics as far as the uh, foreign population versus the local population is concerned. In the United Arab Emirates, approximately 85% of the population, the resident population, is foreign. Thank you. Uh, industries differ in their interest in the demographic shifts. The hotel industry and your region is very different from the uh, manufacturing industry, Mario, in which you are. Um, you manufacture worldwide uh, and uh, maybe these demographic changes don't have any implication for your kind of industry. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? Am I right? Yeah, uh, me, I have, uh, I have uh, this vision. We are in the middle of uh, the transition between two years. Uh, the era of uh, the protagonism when countries uh, were divided by trade barrier and the national rule. And uh, the global era where the markets drive economies. Today, the workforce is under shock because in one hand, it's not clear yet uh, how to respond to the market. On the other hand, the politics, uh, management, labor <coughs> groups and the union have the enormous problem to cope with uh, the change and to safeguard the workforce. This is a problem and we have in Italy as well as the rest of Europe, the US, China and Africa. Now the question is how can we face it? The world, <clears throat> the world wants to know. In my opinion, the answer is it. Improve uh, the education for workers in developing countries. Continue the permanent <clears throat> education program in the developed countries. The key to this is the web. The modern means that illuminates uh, our way. In the past, economy were based on the specialized skills. The future will be based on the super specialized skills. For example, one upon time, a general uh, <coughs> practitioner diagnostic illness. Then came <coughs> the uh, specialists. The future uh, requires super specialists, meaning highly specialized in already specialized field. Consequently, this is the general uh, framework. We must invest more in the younger generations and in specific education. What uh, is being done in Italy and in the rest of uh, Europe is not, uh, <coughs> is not enough. The silver generation needed to be required uh, with uh, a new skill on the job to improve in terms of the technical language and the cultural skill. In the end, the economy of the future will be about uh, brains over brown. Thank you. Um, and I would almost ask the question, but maybe you want to respond to that later. Um, whether there is a, uh, a distinct difference between uh, senior citizens on the one hand, Mario, and others, uh, and other citizens on the other hand, because your kind of industry, of course, focuses on, in, in its marketing and its manufacturing uh, uh, on, on certain age groups, and you may have far less interest 
in, so to say, in infants uh, and far less interest in senior citizens than you have in the bulge of the, uh, of the def demographic py pyramid. We may talk about that later. Let me first ask Timothy uh, what we can do uh, about uh, uh, leveraging, though that's a word which one shouldn't use these days, uh, I will not use leveraging, uh, uh, how we can utilize uh, senior citizens much better and to make sure that we transfer their skills and use those skills as long as possible. Because one of the remarkable things, of course, about the Western world is that retirement, the, the, the mandatory retirement age, has been more or less stable for the past 50, 60 years post-Second World War, right? Uh, while these senior citizens have a much higher life expectancy. So how do you view this? I, I think uh, there uh, should be some proper stance on how we view senior citizens, how we view the aging population. Tell the fact that in China, every year, those people who are ages 64, stepping into 65, is totally 8 million people, 8 million, which the total population even more than Hong Kong, the place that I, when I come. And secondly, we also have to know that only less than 15% of the aging people are really poor in health or in difficulties. The remaining 85% of them are active, still stick with the society, still enjoy their lives. So that's why hotel tourism still would be a very potential market for them. And even they want to be educated, they want to be in touch with this digital inclusion so that they can continue to connect with the society. So to me, to extend the employability of the old people, to keep them in the market, first, we have to relax the retirement age. I don't think there should be a mandatory re retirement age because it's subject to your health situation. As far as you can work, why, why don't you allow be, to work in different models, like hourly basis, work at home, or even work online? So you can contribute your expertise, you can keep on your knowledge and also your experience to your successor. And I think for the younger generation, they want to have you as their mentor. They want to use your experience, use your network, use your access. So we, we try our best to encourage the old people not to stay at home, but to keep themselves as active as possible. Yeah, that's clear, but how do we do this? So in this way, I think firstly, the co companies have to as, at, adopt a policy that engaging more retired employees to back to work. And in fact, in the Hong Kong Jockey Club, Hong Kong Bank, they have a special program to retain their retiree to back, back to work. And also, uh, the company also need to have some adaptation on the modification of their facilities. Like maybe some of the retired employees need to use the wheelchair, then you can you need to have adjust your working table so that the, those who are on wheelchair can still manage the, the, the computer, something like that. So I think we need a lot of adjustment. And also importantly, we have to educate the young employees to welcome the retiree to come back to work. Because sometimes they will worry that they will stuck their promotion. They will delay the promotion opportunity. So I think education is very important, not only to aged people, but also to young employees. To, eat, to have the inclusion. Before we proceed and uh, ask the audience, is there anyone on the panel who wishes to react to one of his colleagues? Yes, I Gerald. I think that uh, especially within the travel and tourism within the hotel business, uh, we were talking about it earlier, um, we don't really want all the old people to keep working because uh, <laughs> older people are great travelers. There's yes. an organization in Europe called Saga, which is a travel yeah. agency. I like to think of it as uh, seniors as global adventurers. Of course. <laughs> and that uh, we get them to continue traveling because they're a huge market source. And they, they don't come during the peak periods, for example, on the leisure side of school holidays. They will come outside the school holidays and uh, a truly important source of business for us. Yep. Thank you. Jaron? Uh, yeah, just uh, two short uh, uh, reflections on something that was said here. Obviously, education, uh, it's uh, clear that education is fundamental in, in, in any, any system or any, any addressing any issue. But uh, I just add to that that education alone is not really enough. Uh, uh, we see a lot of highly educated people, but with the wrong 
uh, wrong focus. And I think this is a point that Mario was pointing to, is that you really have to, have to be able to focus the education into something which is well aligned with the skill requirements in the labor market. And uh, the second point that I'd uh, like to just uh, reflect on, and that's uh, uh, on Timothy's uh, uh, point, which is uh, 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 on engaging in or retaining senior citizens as, as long as possible. And, and, uh, and it's clear, corporate or company cultures need to change in order to, to accommodate that. And uh, just to refer to a recent survey that was done uh, where we tried to gauge what kind of expectations do senior citizens have uh, from, uh, for their uh, future or their long-term engagement in working life. And it's, if you contrast that to the young people who are looking for money, career, and mentorship, and then you contrast that to, the, the, to the older, uh, their older colleagues who start to give much more uh, importance to uh, questions like independence, respect, and recognition. Yeah. And flexibility, which is a point that Timothy made. I think flexibility is so important yes. that people yeah. get older when they work. Yeah. Well, micromanaging that is a huge assignment, of course, for governance and for corporations. Because this is easier said than done, given the reluctance there will be to that flexibility, I would guess. But perhaps we could talk about that in a moment. Let me first look at the audience to see who, who would like to raise a question about what has been discussed so far. A gentleman in the middle. Could you get a microphone over there? Uh, in one of the sessions before about consumption, there was the issue about the number of people actually living on the planet. And I mean, there was the Club of Rome initiative, you know, some years ago that actually was talking about how many people can the planet actually support. And when you talk about, you know, for example, number of cars, in a place like Beijing and whatever and so forth, you clearly see there is, there is a certain limit to, to, to number of people on the planet. There is, for example, India that has no birth controls or no mechanisms on this, while China had one. And I was just wondering whether in this discussion of demographics, one shouldn't have also a perspective about what is the right amount of people that actually the Earth can support in terms of the resources we're having. Yeah, this is a question which has been around for a few centuries, uh, um, and we have been trying to give answers to it. Tijana, would you like to respond to it? I mean, this... this well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question, because a lot of the thinking about it is, is static in terms of... Uh, I mean, you can try to answer at a given technological state of the world. What we don't know is innovation, always, um, in every field. You know whether it's productivity, agricultural productivity, environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I mean, there must be a limit somewhere. Um, it's very, very hard to put, I think, a, a hard, a hard figure on that. Um, it um, fundamentally, every society, if you wish, has to evolve in a way that it has a sustainable, a sustainable model, a sustainable model of, of growth. And the problem you have is that you have spatial imbalan imbalances. Uh, as several panelists said, some countries uh, have a, 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 a demographic structure that is unsustainable, because if you have a shrinking base and a you know, growing top, uh, it's just the maths don't work. You can't, you can't feed the top. It's just not possible. And then the answer largely is, is migration. But the, um, the experience with aging is that it rarely makes people more liberal. So the political implementation of the type of policies that would allow you to, to rebalance the population is challenging for, for any government. Because it's not popular. It is necessary, but it's hard to, it's hard to implement politically. So how do you, how do you, how do you balance that? Sorry, yeah, just one, one final comment on that is that I, I really think that you cannot, actually it's very hard to comment because of that on the absolute number. Because a seven billion well allocated could be very well managed Seven billion all in the wrong places uh, creates a lot of issues. So it's just to, as a foot starter. Uh, Gerald and then Euron and then Tim. Yeah. 
I may be a little bit wrong, but I get the impression, having uh, attended quite a number now of World Economic Forum regional sessions and the uh, forums in Davos, that it is very much the only topic that is not discussed. We always talk about the need for economic development, for economic expansion, and yet we never try to really address this question, how many is enough and at what level of consumption is it enough? Because it's not sustainable whether it takes 50 years, 100 years, or 1,000 years, we're going to run out of everything eventually. And our biggest problem is there are probably too many of us, or the way we consume is not sustainable. And I think that the World Economic Forum should uh, address it a lot more aggressively and come up with opinions, because I think people are too sensitive to it, for whatever, whether it's religious reasons, for example, within my religion, the Catholic religion, where it doesn't want to be talked about, where we're told don't practice contraception, and everybody does. It's, uh, it's something that has to be addressed, and I think it's a great question. Your Honor? Yes, yeah, so obviously a difficult question, and I'm not one to advocate any regulatory uh, limitations on, on, uh, on population growth. But uh, just, to, just to highlight the paradox here, which is uh, on one hand we're looking at a, a tremendous population strain on the world, and when you then uh, contrast that to the labor market, which is uh, increasingly demonstrating or reporting back uh, rampant uh, skill shortages, uh, even during these morose uh, economic times, globally, employers report, the one in three employers report uh, that they can't fill, fill the jobs that they have. So, so obviously, I think I go with, in the direction of, uh, of TM, which is, uh, which is to say we really need to look at, a, a, on a global scale, uh, on, on, uh, at the fluidity of the labor markets, but not only national labor markets, but global labor markets. Yes. Yeah, though our governance systems don't really allow for that, do they? Um, we, um, I'm just thinking, you were talking about the regulator, you don't want to be the regulator, but we have a regulator uh, on monetary issues, we have a regulator on environmental issues. Could we have a population regulator? I mean, I leave it as an open question. Timothy. The, the same as I want to mention is that if we want to regulate the population, it means that we want to have some population gender or population policy, but who is going to do this? The UN or which country? I think all are danger for us. So I think maybe back to the basic, is under the natural adjustment and including the my way worker can help something. Because you know, just in some countries they have a lot of maize that export or work in other countries to balance off the shortage of the, of the maize. So I think this can be a natural marketing demand and supply issue that when there is a need, and the important issue is that we have to uh, streamline the policy that allow the migrant worker to work in other places and also to provide proper provision with insurance and uh, mandatory provision funds, such and such, so that when they go back to their home, they can really enjoy their later life with tourists, enjoyment and education. Which we have very much in Dubai, where every, every employer has to pay into a fund for his foreign employer yes, when right. they leave after a number of years exactly. to get this lump sum to take back with them. Yeah. Uh, whether it's enough or not is another question, but at least it does recognize the fact and it leaves itself open to allow people to come into his country to share in their wealth. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let me look to the audience again. Are there other questions in the audience? No. I'm the journalist from Sino, the, uh, the biggest uh, portal website in China. I want to ask that, um, we know, in China there, um, there is family planning, and when family uh, is forced to have only one child, um, on, on one hand, China makes great um, contributions to global population control, but on the other hand, we know uh, chi children in China, they are so lonely because they don't have many brothers or sisters. Um, as well, their parents are also lonely because they don't have a much company. Uh, so how do you treat this problem? And uh, just now you mentioned the freedom, but uh, the freedom in China is uh, relative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, th this, is, of course, is a, is a very complex question. It's a complex question because every 
region in the world, every country in the world, has not only its own uh, political system, but also its own cultural systems, plural, uh, sometimes religion. And uh, in some cases, that implies uh, birth control, and in others, it does not. Um, and that all has social and sociological impacts, as you rightly uh, uh, refer to. Um, I don't know whether it's, uh, do any of the panelists want to, uh, to react to this? Do they have a view? Yes, your Honor. Well, I will not go in, in into the into the politics of this, but maybe just to highlight a, a few realities of the of the current policies, and, and and that is that the workforce in China might be still growing, but just for a few years, yes. and after a few years, even in China, the workforce will be declining. Now that decline is going to accelerate, and uh, if you then look at it over a medium-term uh, 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 time span, what you're looking at is is, is uh, less workers supporting more non-working age uh, uh, non-working uh, age population, and in order to make up for that, what uh, something that I call the productivity challenge of uh, demographics. Uh, China would have to produce, uh, on average, every year, 1.5% uh, pro labor productivity improvement in order to in order to compensate for the change ratio. Now, uh, in today's situation where China is is doing doing uh, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to reduce its uh, employment uh, uh, economic growth to 7%, 1.5% might seem like a, a piece of cake. But uh, uh, will uh, China be able to do 7%, uh, 10%, uh, uh, 15, 20 years from now? Probably we'll be looking at a gradually declining uh, economic growth, and then the 1.5% will become a major, major challenge. Other commentators? Yeah, Timothy? I, I think uh, what you're concerned about, it will be also not necessarily be true, because in the coming 20 years, maybe the industrial trade or type of China will change. Because now we are on manufacturing, but later on maybe on service, on service industry, or on IT technology. That means you don't need to have too much, a huge volume of labor. That means, and at that moment, if we are our so-called population size growing well stable, then it may not be a problem. But I think, uh, as you asked about one-child policy, I do think there should need a lot of infrastructure to back up this policy, like the uh, sustainability of manpower supply, the sustainability of uh, parental care after your parents growing old, who's going to take care? I think all this requires a lot of infrastructure, social policy, and social provisions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other? I, yeah, yeah, Gerald. Well, I think it still comes back to what was said earlier, is that we're not looking, we keep looking at this uh, as a, a national problem rather than a global problem. Mm -hmm. And we just don't want to talk about the mobility of labor. And again, I see if people can be brought in to share the wealth of a place like the GCC and they come in as guest workers, why would it not be possible in five, ten years' time, if this demographic time bomb actually occurs, that people from other parts of the world wouldn't <coughs> come to work in China? And I think that it's something that the whole human race has to really start to understand, that the world is all ours, it's everybody's. And this mobility of labor, though it may seem a little bit uh, uh, altruistic, but I think it will happen that, uh, by necessity, because as you say, the Chinese economy will grow. Yeah. They will need people in the service industry, yeah. and they will need people from Africa and other parts of the world to come and work here. If I may, I always sure. find it fascinating, because it's, it's something that we've done through most of the history of mankind. Exactly. Uh, the stopping of migration is a modern invention. I know, up to the 19th yeah. century, that's how everything has been resolved, from Ireland to you yes, know, everywhere. Exactly. You couldn't have enough somewhere, you just moved. And I, I was Climate saying, change, you moved. In, Chi in China, you might have yeah. mandatory contraception now, but if you were wealthy enough, if, if the wealth was spread throughout China, you would have voluntary contraception. Mm. Okay, you wouldn't have one child, you'd have two children. Mm. But it would still be not enough, probably, in mm. the longer term, <laughs> to replace the population. But on, on a more positive note, I, I think I came the first time in Dalian in 1984. I, I don't know if you were born, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, it's a very positive thing that we can sit here. If someone had told me then that I would sit at the World Economic Forum meeting here and that a young Chinese journalist would ask that question, I probably would have been skeptical. So uh, there's reason for being optimistic.
Thank you, Tatiana. Others in the audience. Yes, yes in the. Uh, the lady. Yes. I think to build on the question that was just asked, um, I was wondering. Uh, the Economist uh, reported quite recently about the uh, male-female split, particularly in the younger generation. And I was wondering how the panel saw that playing out, and I think particularly building on the comments from Mr. Lawless about um, the, the, how that would impact globally um, through the global migration. Well, <coughs> who was the taker on Who's this? Taker? You? You're on. Well, um, let me give a stab at it. Um, the uh, and, and linking it to the uh, to the last notion there of the uh, of the global uh, migration, um, I think it is it is very very clear that uh, global migration is set to increase despite the uh, uh, in some areas of the world. There is an increasing uh, reticence to actually actually allow for it, but uh, uh, it is set to increase, and, and, and the drivers for that increase is, is, is really lies in the in the in the labour market and the skill requirements and how those those uh, skill requirements are being met, and that is is where I would connect in with the with the with the gender split. Uh, uh, the, the, the importance here again goes back to the, to the how do we link the edu education systems with the labor markets in such a way that the, the, uh, the uh, 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 irrespective of which gender, but I think uh, particularly uh, the female part of the population, actually focuses in on increasingly on, on skills that are hugely in, in need uh, in the uh, labor markets. Uh, yeah, I think also as employers, particularly to try to, to employ more females in our industry, and we need it badly within the hotel industry, we have to become a lot more enlightened as to how we do that in terms, for example, of providing creche facilities, of uh, having paternity and maternity leave. And I know everybody says, oh, you're just adding on cost to it, but if we really want to get loyal employees and to give good career prospects to women, we've got to get over this very old-fashioned view that uh, they, if they're going to have babies, they've got to stop work forever. And this, this is still happening a lot. I think it's incumbent on us to do an awful lot more than we're doing. Yeah, you're on. Just uh, one, one addition, because uh, always when we talk about the, the gender balance uh, in, in the labor markets, uh, we tend to have a spine reaction to, uh, after all of the well-meaning introductions, uh, to, to fall back on something that we relate to much, uh, much more comfortably, and that goes in, in into, the, into promoting women for, for manage, management positions, as, as, as also you pointed out, and that's, all, that's very, very good. But the real impact is not going to be in the top management jobs. The real impact is going to be how well we are going to be able to, to attract and to accomplish Accommodate female, uh, female, female workforce lower down in the hierarchy. That's where the masses are. I think that's absolutely right. Um, it, it leads me to a question uh, which I'd like to take each of the panel members, ask them to, to think about what they believe must be the priority in their various regions, if I may assign each of you your own region, just hypothetically, right? What must be the main demographic policy action? That's never a policy action for a year or for two years, but it's always you know, a generation policy action, given that this is demographics. It's obvious what the dilemma is in China, which was raised a moment ago. Uh, it's also obvious what the dilemma is in some other regions. What is the recommended priority policy action, for instance, in the Gulf, Gerald? Well, I would say in the Gulf that we have to continue with our enlightened immigration policy where people are allowed to come in and work. Okay, I can understand a country like the United Arab Emirates where it's outnumbered 
by uh, 8020 or whatever by foreigners that they don't want to allow uh, people to stay forever but they will give long term residency and they will allow people to continue to renew their employment visas so it gives very good employment prospects to foreigners to people I, I believe it must give priority to Arab people to come into that part of the world to maintain their culture and uh, their own heritage but the burning issue for us is to ensure as uh, Goran was saying that we have relevant education this is why I've been trying very hard to get more and more vocational education that will suit specifically our industry right to the point of actually we want to set up uh, within the industry in Dubai a vocational uh, institution for uh, travel tourism and hospitality so that we can train people who will then look at especially with local people as well as foreign residents living in, in, in the city who will then be quite happy to come Go, come to this vocational school, know that they will have employment because the industry is supporting the vocational school. So education is, is, is absolutely vital and uh, that places like Dubai continue to show the example with their enlightened approach to, uh, to female employment and to uh, female equality within society. But that's probably not contentious, is it? No. No. Not at all. Okay, you think I, of something I, which is contentious. I would tell you, but even a, a little story. We, we, within our Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management, which is our small university, where we do foundation courses during the summer period for uh, people from the Emirates, Emirati as the nationals are called, to uh, think about coming into the hotel business because culturally there's a bit of resistance because they don't want to be associated with alcohol or they just feel that it's not something that they really want to do. We show them that there are lots of jobs other than that associated with alcohol if they want to work in a hotel. And I was giving a lecture once to, uh, to a group of, of ladies, of Emirati ladies, mm -hmm. about the hotel industry during this foundation course. And at the end of it, one lady in the, uh, in the questions and answers put up her hand and she said, um, would you consider doing a cocktail reception or a reception some evening and invite our parents so you can tell them what you've told us so we can, you, they can then realize we've made the right choice? And then one of the other girls put her hand up and she said, and yes, and that's a great idea, and if you do it, will you please invite my uncle and aunt to come along as well, because they need to be educated as to the, the use of this. So a lot of it is cultural, and it is part of the older people who just don't want to see that it is quite good for their youngsters, whether they're male or female, to work in all industries, and not just in the civil service, as we find uh, most of them do within the United Arab Emirates. Sorry for the long answer. No, that's, uh, that's, very, that's very encouraging, in fact. Uh, Dijan, what, what, uh, looking for a moment at the UK where you are based and where, where your company's business is, yeah. what is the most contentious, contentious policy priority there, you think? Okay. I have to say that the UK is about 15% of the group, but I, I'll still try to answer. Um, I think it's around things we've discussed because um, we're having that demographic transition with the extension of the life, uh, increasing the life expectancy growing aging population and a kind of a shrinking base to finance that and yes there is a notion that people can work lo longer but as we say in the UK it's a, it's a work till you drop but you know it's not it's not a good formula there are life accidents and uh, people cannot work until 80 so that has limitations um, there is also the idea that people are going to have to reduce their expectations and the pensions themselves will go down which I think is un unavoidable. But even the combination of those two things is not enough to, to deal with the issue. So I think whatever you say, you're brought back to this issue of migration and, and correcting that imbalance through uh, the import of a, of a large number of people. I think actually the UK, uh, probably the most advanced among the developed countries in that respect is the US, but it's probably followed by the UK, which is relatively yeah. open and has imported a lot of people from Poland uh, over the last seven, eight years, uh, which frankly helps. Uh, but uh, clearly needs, needs to do more. Now, it's not, it's not a popular message, but I think it's a message that the political leaders are going to have to uh, emphasize more and more. Yeah. Mario, what? Italy has a shrinking population, an aging yes. and shrinking population. So, and, and Venice is sinking, right? Um, <laughs> what is the policy priority, the contentious policy priority on demographics? Me, maybe uh, I have a story uh, to tell uh, just to support uh, this conversation. And uh, I am an entrepreneur, and uh, I realized a, a company in Italy uh, in very, very short times, uh, in 15 years. Uh, and, uh, and now my company produces shoes and uh, is uh, the larger 
company in Italy and uh, is the second in the world classification lifestyle category. At the base, uh, we invest a lot uh, in the human resource, in uh, younger generation and the senior together. I remember when I start uh, 15 years ago, we introduced five people. After uh, 15 years later, in our company were 30,000 employees. And we take together to work. To the younger generation, we organize the, the, we invest in the culture, we introduce the school. At the moment, we have uh, four schools, private schools the technician school, manager school, uh, top manager school, etc. And uh, we trained inside uh, these uh, people, these employees that came. And uh, in the end, they utilize the experience for the senior. Because uh, in my sector, uh, the senior is very indis indispensable uh, because the fashion, you understand the fashion is fresh, but you need the experience this. Is. And uh, in uh, European and Italian economy, I believe that this way is necessary. Here, now we are in Asia, we are in China. The economy situation, GDP is totally different. But me, now I, I talk about my experience because the world is not only China. The world is the Europe, East America. And uh, I believe that okay, in the future, I confirm what I see you, he, the, the politic, the new politic is the new industrialist to invest uh, not in the manufacture, but uh, in the brain. Thank you. Timothy, contentious policy actions in Hong Kong and or China? Um, I think we have to consider to adopt an elderly-friendly policy. Elderly-friendly, it means inclusion, it means no matter you produce your product, you consider the need of the old people, and never think that old people like the dark color, the gray color. They are energetic. They also like the bright one. So I think we, when, when we think about the so-called silver market, and you have to really ask what the old people want, and not only from your manufacturing perspective. And furthermore, we also have to tackle the ageism, the issue on ageism. Ageism means you are not giving the, we are not asking for the top party or party that other than young people should wait, but we ask for equal treatment. And the ageism means that we have to have some so-called ordinance or some strict requirement that when you recruit employees, you should also open the recruitment for old people that they can compete together. So I think all this can be a very, uh, important policy that a government like Hong Kong, China, and different parts of the world to adopt, to make sure that our old people are our asset, but not our liability. Thank you. Finally, you uh, just uh, realize how uh, stateless I uh, am, probably a typical example of an international migrant worker. Um, but let me, if, if, I'll, if you allow, uh, take two gauges on this. Uh, one uh, uh, from Europe, because I do work a lot uh, uh, on Europe in, on these issues. And, um, and just to say, uh, uh, emphasize the importance of political leadership uh, on this. Uh, the European politicians uh, in and around this whole question of labor migration uh, and the way that that yeah. potentially would come in and into, into this uh, addressing the demographic uh, Im implications to the labor markets are basically backing down uh, and, uh, and, and really we need political leadership. And it's not an easy, easy call to make because uh, think of, uh, about it. In, in, in this, this sense that you're an aspiring politician yes. to be, to be uh, uh, elected, and now you want to have put together a, a dream ticket for uh, addressing the issue. You're basically going to tell, tell your potential electorate four things. Uh, reduce uh, uh, or shrink the economy, work harder, uh, retire later, and bring in more foreigners. Those are the four areas of, 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 of answers, and it requires really a very, very courageous and, and, and a visionary politician in order to, in order to uh, break through that, but we need it. The other gauge uh, uh, that I'd, uh, Victor, that I'd like to just uh, give on is because I've been working with, uh, in, in the de developing world on this as well, 
and uh, uh, we increasingly are, are uh, faced with, with uh, migration-related limitations, which are hampering or rendering foreign direct investment uh, ventures ineffective because they go in into the country, uh, the government expects uh, nationals to be, uh, to be uh, um, uh, employed, which I find is a, is a, is a good objective, but uh, 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 slamming on quotas for that will only delay the actual effectiveness of those investments, and we've seen this in, in many, many countries. Thank you. Uh, I, I couldn't think of a better closing remark than the one you have just made, so I will refrain from my option to, uh, to try to summarize where I think the core of the issue is going forward. Um, I think we owe a great thanks to, uh, to the uh, insights provided by the panel and for you to come to this session. Thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. Well done. Thank you very much.